Alrighty, I have you turn in your Bibles to the book of Philemon. That's right, that's located in your Bible right after the pastoral epistles. Again, that's the book of Philemon. So you have 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, and then Philemon. I'm going to go ahead and uh, begin by reading the book of Philemon. It's not divided or sectioned into chapters. There's only 25 verses, so I'll go ahead and read that. <clears throat> Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer, and to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged. <clears throat> And now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I beseech thee for my, my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me, whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him, that is mine own bowels, whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind would I do nothing. That thy benefits should not be as it were of necessity, but what but willingly. For be, perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever. Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me. But how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee, or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand, I will repay it. Albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thine own self. Besides, yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my vows in the Lord. Having, having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. But withal, prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. There salute the Epaphras, my fellow, sir, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Is that turned on? I believe so. I don't think it's turned on, though. Now let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for this night. We thank you for this year, dear Heavenly Father. We thank Amen. you just, uh, for preserving your word, preserving Amen. our lives, for preserving our salvation, dear God. And we ask, dear Lord, that, uh, that we would go into 2018 as a better Christian, that we go into 2018 with big goals to do big things for you, dear Heavenly Father. And we ask you, to, I would ask you tonight, dear Lord, personally, that you would bless me with your spirit, God, that, that you would allow me to speak only the truth, dear Lord, that you would give me clarity of mind, dear God, and that you would uh, allow me to have utterance to speak and to make known your word. And we love you so much, and just be with us here tonight, dear God, and in Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen. Now, for context, Paul is writing, as we saw, to a man by the name of Philemon, and the purpose of the letter is that a servant had abandoned his master, a servant had abandoned, had abandoned his boss. The servant's name, as we saw there, was Onesimus. And I'm not sure what type of servitude this was, whether this was like on a voluntary basis, maybe he was a hand on that, on that plot or on that land, and he was just helping him out, or whether this was like some sort of like indentured servitude. It was a contract, and he just served him almost as if he was a slave. But either way, he had left without telling Philemon, and he ended up with Paul. He obviously already knew Paul, and that's why, and that's how, that, that Paul knew who Philemon was and who Onesimus was here. And so he 
obviously went and he sought Paul out purposely. Now, I want to read for you just for educational purposes. It's good to know the Bible and to know how many, when other people or who people are when things are mentioned in the Bible. And Onesimus' name comes up one other time in the Bible, and that's Colossians chapter number 4, verse number 7. The Bible says, All my state, all my state shall Titus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. Then it says this, Whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. They shall make known unto you all things which are done here. So when Paul wrote the, the letter to the church, the churches of Colossae, he sent that letter with Tychicus, and, he, and it says that Onesimus was, was also with him. That was who was delivering the letter. Now, from what we read here in Philemon, it doesn't seem like Onesimus was saved. And that, and that maybe Paul knew Philemon, and then Onesimus, when he left, he knew that Paul was just a great guy. Paul had a reputation of being a, a great man of God. So when he fled, he went to Paul, and then Paul preached him the gospel, and it says he begot him in his bonds. And he said, now when you receive him, don't just receive him as a worker. Don't just receive him as a servant, but much more than that. Receive him now as a brother, because now he got saved. Now he is a brother in Christ. And he sends him back to him. So he beseeches him to, when he receives him, he explains that if he did anything wrong when he left, if when he left that angered you or when he left he took something with him that, was, that he wasn't supposed to, that he had stolen something, he says, don't charge him with that. He says, I will repay it myself. He says, he, you know, you know, don't hold him responsible for it. He says, put that on my account. And I want you to look at these words, and this is the part I want to focus on here. In verse number, let's start reading here in verse number 19. He says, I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. <laughs> Excuse me. I will repay it, albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thine own self besides. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Now, home in on verse number 21. There's a concept, of, a specific concept that I want to focus on here. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee. So he says first, I wrote unto you because I was confident and I already knew that you would be obedient to what I had wrote you. Now watch what he says next. So first, having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. So what a great reputation that the man Philemon had. Paul wrote unto him and he told him, I already know, I have confidence that when I write this to you, I know that you're going to do whatever I ask you to do. I know that when I beseech you or that when I order you to do something, I already know that you're going to do it. I'm confident in that. And not only that, I know that you'll do even more than what I've asked. The title of my sermon this evening is entitled Going Above and Beyond. And I'm going to show that this is actually a doctrine that's taught from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. And all of the successful Christians throughout the Bible, they all held and they all had this characteristic or this quality or this attribute, if you will. And this is something that God, from beginning to end of the Bible, he teaches this is a quality that Christians should have. And a quality that he desires us to have. He doesn't, God doesn't want us just to be a mediocre Christian. God doesn't want us just to be a standard Christian or just a normal, average Christian. God wants us to go above and beyond. And tomorrow will be the first day of 2018. And when I had already chosen this, this topic to preach on, I started thinking about something that when this year is wrapping up, you know, there's a lot of major corporations that are located, their headquarters are located in Cincinnati. And you know, you have like Toyota, Mitsubishi, uh, Procter & Gamble, Fifth Third, and then the largest uh, uh, grocery store chain or supermarket chain in the entire United States in the world. Does anybody know who it is? Kroger. Kroger. They are the largest grocery store or supermarket in the world. They, they own more properties than anyone else. At the end of each year, they all have, they call a meeting. All the big bosses, the CEOs, finance department, the executives, they all show up and they all sit around a table and they analyze all the statistics, they analyze the numbers, the input, the output, they analyze you know, just every aspect of the business, the new products that they came out with, and they, what they're doing is they're comparing the progress of 2017 to 2016. And when they walk out that door, the overarching purpose is this year, when, when 2018 starts, we have goals to do something even more than what we did last year. 
What they're working for and what these companies are doing, obviously we have to earn a living and there's nothing wrong with that, but how much more should we care at the end of the year that we're going to be a better Christian in 2018 than we were in 2017? So when if these people that are, that are working hard to do great things, you know, for a business, if you will, and they're working hard for money or something like that, they're striving for a corruptible crown. When we have something in heaven that's, that's known as an incorruptible crown that fades not away, uh, that we're going to have for all eternity. So how much more should we have a big goal? And anyone who knows me personally is around me a lot. When I do something, I normally take it very, very serious. And I try hard, and I, and I have really big you know, goals for things. And I think in Christianity, everyone should have a very big goal because we don't serve a small God. We serve a very big God. Amen. And the Bible teaches that without a, a, if, if, when the people have no vision, they perish. Right. So we as individuals going into 2018, we for ourselves should have big goals of things that we're going to do. And I don't want everyone in here just to go into 2018 to say that they're going to do better. I want everybody to go into 2018 and say, I want to go above and beyond. I want to do more than I've ever done for God in 2018. I want to dedicate my life more than I ever have. And I want to do great things for God. Now, like I said, I'm going to show that this is a doctrine that's taught. This is something that God desires for us to have. And all the great men of the Bible had this attribute. First, I want to start with turning your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter number 18. 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 This is a story about Saul and David. And David is a man in the Bible. He's someone that was known as a man after God's own heart. He's the best example of anyone that you can have in the Old Testament, at least. You can make an argument in the New Testament of John, who is, uh, you know, the man that is, that is the, he's the greatest man, Jesus Christ says, that was born. So look here at, at 1 Samuel chapter number 18, verse number 22. The Bible reads, And Saul commanded his servants, saying, Commune with David secretly, and say, Behold, the king hath delight in me, and all his servants love thee. Now, therefore, be the king's son-in-law, and Saul's servant. Spake, spake those words, and Saul's servant spake those words in the ears of David. And David said, Seemeth it to you a light thing to be a king's son-in-law, seeing that I am a poor man and lightly esteemed? And the servants of Saul told him, saying, On this manner spake David. And Saul said, Thus shall ye say to David, The king desireth not any dowry, but a hundred foreskins of the Philistines, to be avenged of the king's enemies. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. So we can see here that, that, that Saul was not sincere. Saul's like, hey, he's, tr he's trying to pick out something extreme. He tells David, I want you to go and I want you to kill a hundred Philistines. And not only do I want you to kill them, I want you to bring their foreskins back just to prove that you had done it. Which is obviously an extreme feat. Now look what he says right here. Verse number 26. And when his servants told David these words, watch this. It pleased David well to be the king's son-in-law. So he knew at this moment, this is something that I can do. He's not trusting in himself. He's trusting in God, of course. It says, it pleased David well to be the king's son-in-law, and the days were not expired. It says in verse 27, wherefore David arose and went, he and his men, and slew of the Philistines. Now this is very easy to read over if you're not paying attention. Yeah. 200 men, and David brought their foreskins, and they gave them in full tale to the king. Now, how many foreskins did he request in the beginning? 100. 100. But if you notice here, when David goes out, David doesn't go out and bring back 100. It was already an extreme you know, uh, feat that he was going to be going after. But he goes out, and he doesn't only bring back 100, he brings back 200. Now keep reading. And David brought their foreskins, and they gave them in full tale to the king that he might be the king's son-in-law. And Saul gave him Michal, his daughter, to wife. And then we'll read the next couple of verses. And Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David, and that Michal, Saul's daughter, loved him. So notice, when David did this, Saul looked at David, and he said that he knew. Said, the Bible tells you. So the narrator of the Bible, the Holy Spirit, said that Saul knew that the Lord was with him. You know why? Because David didn't just do something mediocre. David didn't just go out there and even do what Saul had requested of him. He went out and he did that, and then he went above and beyond. Amen. He went the extra mile. He didn't just do the average, or he didn't just do the standard. He went even farther than what Saul had requested from him. 
Turn in your Bibles to uh, Exodus chapter number 36. We'll see another example of the Old Testament. I'm going to read a verse from you from 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, verse number 58. The Bible says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So notice it says, always abounding in the work of the Lord. So what does it mean to abound? What does it mean to have an abundance of something? It means you have more than what you need. So when he says you're always abounding, it's just referring to something that you're doing. He's saying you're doing more than what you need to do. You're not only just doing great. You're doing, you're abounding. You're doing more than what you need to do. Amen. Abounding in the work of the Lord. Now let's look there at Exodus chapter number 36. Exodus chapter number 36. Here's an example of, from even farther back than David. Exodus chapter number 36. We'll begin reading verse number 1 for the context sake. It says, Then brought Bezalel and Ahat, Ahaliah, and every wise-hearted man in whom the Lord put wisdom, and understanding to know how to work all manner of work, for the service of the sanctuary, and to, uh, excuse me, according to all that the Lord had commanded. So he's talking about they're building the sanctuary right now. God gave you know, all of the instructions. He gave all the details of what the, 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 uh, the, the sanctuary was going to look like. And now they're putting together the men. They're getting ready. They're getting ready to get to work to build the sanctuary. Verse number two. And Moses called Bezalel and Aaliah and every wise-hearted man in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom. Even everyone whose heart stirred him up to come unto the work to do it. So notice it keeps emphasizing work, that they're doing work. Work to do it. Verse 3. And they received of Moses all the offering which the children of Israel had brought for the work of the service of the sanctuary. Notice work over and over again. To make it with all. And the, so they're working with their hands. And they brought yet unto him. I want you to notice this. I, I think this is very important that it uses this exact wording. They brought unto him free offerings every morning. So are these offerings, are these something that are, is this voluntary? Are they bringing this by, is it, is it mandatory or are they just bringing it because they just want to bring it? It's free offerings. It's free will offerings, right? So it says free offerings every morning. And all the wise men that wrought, so notice working keeps coming up. All the work of the sanctuary came every man from his work which they made. And they spake unto Moses saying, watch this. The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded to make. That's a good problem to have. So they have everybody coming into the, the church of the Old Testament, the congregation. And, and, and God commands them, hey, we need this type of material. We can't do anything without it. And he puts out a command, hey, can you bring this material? Moses does. All the wise-hearted men are coming to work. And guess what? They bring way too much. That's not the problem that most churches have. It's actually the exact opposite. But in this case, he's like, hey, they bring, they're bringing way too much. They're not only doing what Moses needed them to do, they're going above and beyond. They're not only doing what was requested of them or the standard or just what was mediocre or moderate. They wanted to do even more than that. Look at what it says next, too, as well. It says so, and uh, we read there in verse number 5 and verse number 6 says, And Moses gave commandment, and they caused it to be pro proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, let neither man nor woman make any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from, from bringing. It's funny that it uses the word restrained. Because that almost denotes or implies to me like they want to keep doing it. Like they want to keep bringing stuff. And he's like, that's enough, guys. We have to. And notice, it's not only that, that what they're doing. It's not like they're just coming there and just sitting. These people are coming and they're doing work. I mean, it's, it's easy a lot of times to get people to come to church, but it's harder to get them to volunteer to do work. These people are doing the work, and they're showing up. They're making stuff and building stuff, and then they come then to help after that. Now, on top of it, and look what it says, too, verse number 7. For the stuff they had was sufficient for all the work to make it. Now, watch these three words. And too much. They had too much. They had, now, this is a good example. I want you to notice how many times the word work came up. But not only that, one thing, let's look at this real quick. Go back to verse number one. Then brought Bezalel and Aaliah and every wise-hearted man. You look in verse, uh, well, there in verse one again, you see the word, in whom the Lord put wisdom and understanding. And then you skip down again to verse number two, and it says, and every wise-hearted man in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom. So if you at this time were looking for an example of an elder or a man of God, and you saw Bezalel here, and Aaliah, and these men were doing some work, 
If you were to try to pattern your life after them, like it's smart to do, and you see someone that's successful at something, you should try to be like them and learn from them. If you were to do that, you know what attribute you would pick up from them? You would go above and beyond. You wouldn't just do the normal. You wouldn't just do, you know, just what's sufficient. You would, when you did work, you do where, where, where your boss is going to tell you, all right, that's enough. You've done too much. That's enough. You need to go home. You've been working too many hours. Or when you come to church, they're going to say, hey, we need somebody else to volunteer because you're doing everything. That's an attribute that you would acquire from these type of people. And great men of God. And here, one thing, too, a good point to learn when just interpreting the Bible or lead, uh, when you're reading the Bible to understand it is when the when the narrator is speaking, that's the Holy Spirit. So repeatedly, when he keeps saying, the Bible tells you that that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Amen. Moses penned these words, but God is, is the one speaking these words through yes. Moses. So when the, it keeps saying these are wise-hearted men, wise-hearted men, that's God saying these men are wise. And you know what a quality of a wise-hearted man is? He doesn't only do what's asked of him. He's not only obedient like Philemon, but he does even more also, like Paul said that he was. He goes above and beyond. He goes the extra mile. I'm going to have you turn to another passage. Go to, uh, go to Mark chapter number 3, verse number 20. Mark chapter number 3, verse number 20. We'll go to the New Testament. And of course, it's always great to see our Savior as the ultimate example. Mark chapter number 3, verse number 20. This was, of course, true of our Savior as well. He had this attribute of going above and beyond and not just doing, you know, the, uh, just what's commanded of him, but even doing more than that. Romans chapter number 15, verse number 13, I'm going to read to you. Excuse me, Romans chapter number 15, verse number 13, the Bible says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. And then he says that, that ye may abound in hope through the, prayer, through the power of the Holy Ghost. And Paul, in the New Testament, I believe, was the greatest Christian. And when he would write to people, oftentimes he requests of them, like, I don't want you only to do well. I don't want you only to, to succeed in your Christian life. But he uses that word over and over again of abounding. I want you to abound in love. I want you to abound in charity. I want you to abound in hope, as he says right here, which would be like faith. And that would be like, if you remember that, this just popped into my mind. If you remember when the disciples come to, to Jesus Christ, and obviously the disciples are an example for us to look at. But they weren't even satisfied where they were in their Christian life. They came to Jesus and they said, Lord, increase our faith. They, didn't, they weren't happy with where they were in their Christian life. They wanted to continually abound. They wanted to continually just grow in their faith and grow in their knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that's the attitude that we should have. We should want to learn more. We should want to grow more. We should want to abound in our Christian life. Look at Mark chapter number 3, verse number 20. Mark chapter number 3, verse number 20. Quickly, uh, the context here, if you, if you scan through this, the book of the Gospels, all, you know, they all line up in their parallels, but they all have a theme. And, the, and Mark specifically focuses on the work that Jesus does. There's a lot less, if you have a red letter Bible, there's a lot less letter, red letters in the book of Mark because Jesus is constantly working. He's doing work just all the time. And here, in, just in the chapter of Mark, if you scan through there quickly with your eyes, you'll see he's like healing someone in the very beginning of this, the man with the withered hand. You know, he's like getting on a ship, and he's crossing the ship, he's healing multitudes that are coming to him. It talks about him casting out devils. He's preparing his disciples, and he's sending his disciples out. He's just working constantly. I want you to look at Mark chapter 3. Let's actually read a little bit more context here. So he, he finishes there in verse 19, naming off all the disciples whom he had just ordained. And it says this, verse number 19. And Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him, and it says this. And they went into a house. So his disciples, all of them, after they got back from soul winning, after they went out and preached the gospel, it says they went into a house. And it says, verse 20. And the multitude cometh together again. So the multitude had left for a period of time there. And they get a break. And it says that the disciples go into the house. And it says, and the multitude cometh together again, so that they could not so much as eat bread. Verse number 21. And when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold on him. For they said, he is beside himself. What does it mean to be beside yourself? It means like you're crazy. Yeah. These are the disciples seeing Jesus. And they're out preaching the gospel. He's out healing the sick. He's out doing miracles, preaching God's word to the believers, and, you know, uh, fellowshipping with people, feeding people. He's just doing all kinds of great miracles. And then they finally get a break. I don't know how long it was. Maybe they didn't eat for a couple days. You know, Jesus went a lot longer than that in other examples. 
But maybe they didn't eat for a full day, and they finally get a break to eat, and they probably had it scheduled, like, hey, well, next time we get a break, we need to get something to eat. I'm starving. And then guess what happened? They look around, and Jesus isn't there. And they go outside, and guess what he's doing? He's working more. He's working more. He didn't stop yet. He wasn't ready to stop. He wanted to go above and beyond. He wanted to do more than what they had scheduled. Like, hey, we're going to take a break when we get this opportunity. But Jesus said, no, I'm going to go out, and I'm going to do a little bit more. Go turn, if you will, to uh, Matthew chapter number 26. Matthew chapter number 26, verse number 36. I'm going to read to you quickly from John chapter number 15. <clears throat> John chapter number 15, verse number 2. Jesus said this. He's speaking unto his disciples before he uh, went to the cross. He said in the Garden of Gethsemane, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit. So if you bear fruit, watch what he says. He purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. So it's not only good enough just to bring forth fruit in the beginning. He wants you to do more than that. He wants you to go above and beyond. He's not just happy with just, oh, I got to this point in my Christian life and I think I'm done. No. God said he's going to purge it and you're going to bring forth more fruit. Amen. Look in Matthew chapter number 26, verse number 36. And I want you to pay attention to the wording. Because I like the wording. And also the context of this passage. You have Jesus. And this is where you can see the humanity of Christ more than you, the more than you can in all of his, his ministry. You know, we're fundamentalists, so we believe Jesus Christ is 100% God, he's fully God, and he's also fully man. It wasn't like a demonstration when he came down here. He really suffered, he really died, he really went through temptations, and that's why he's able to be our high priest. And when you see him here in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, you see Jesus Christ in, in temptation, suffering. He says, Lord, please let this cup pass from me. You know, so we can see the side of his humanity, but I want you to watch him, and this is, this is, this is an ideal example of, of Jesus as just he, him being our perfect example. Look at Matthew chapter number 26, verse number 36, and like I said, I want you to notice the wording. So it says, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And then watch this, this, this wording here. And he went a little further, and fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Verse 40. And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Verse 42. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O oh my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of the sinner. So look at that verse right there at the end. Jesus Christ was not wondering when these men were going to come. And he wasn't wondering how long it was going to be until he had to go to the cross. He already knew. He knew when those men were coming. So imagine putting yourself in his shoes or understanding how he felt when he knows the sorrow, he knows the pain, he knows the agony that he's getting ready to go to. And you know what? He went and he, and he prayed, but then the Bible says he went a little farther. He went a little further. He didn't give up. Not only that, it says that he went back and he talked to his disciples, and it says that he went out a second time. And then he went back again, talked to his disciples and checked on them, and he went out a third time. He went above and beyond. He didn't go. He didn't. Obviously, our Lord and our Savior, you know, he, there, there is no, you know, uh, um, if you will, prophets or anything that could ever compare unto him. There are no, there is no religion that has any type of, you know, uh, uh, a preacher or anything that can ever be like Jesus Christ. Amen. So when he's, he's the only one that in a situation like this that could have done that. But you know what? He's a perfect example for us. That we need to also go above and beyond. We need to try to do more than what's asked of us. We need to not try to be just happy with the standard, but to do more. I'm going to have you turn over to another passage. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. I'm going to read to you from Matthew 25 verse 14. Matthew 25 verse 14. It's a parable that Jesus told. 
<clears throat> and the parable says this. In Matthew chapter 25, verse number 14, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants, servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, and to another two, and to another one. To every man according to his several ability. So these, this is actually where we actually, at this time the word talent didn't mean what, we, what it means today. It's funny how strongly the King James Bible has, uh, has, a, has changed or impacted our language. This is where we got our word talent from that actually means ability, from this parable right here. So he says he gave them talents according to their ability. And then it says there um, in verse 16, Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. So he has ten total. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. So they both multiplied or doubled what they were given. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Amen. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Amen. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Here's the third guy. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. So he has that one talent. Now watch what it says next. Verse number 26, his Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant. Thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gathered where I have not straw. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. So this represents a parable of, his, of, the, of each man being given of his several ability. It talks about. And of men being of men possessing certain talents. And over and over again, the Bible will talk about unto whom much is given, of him shall much be required. So the, the more you've heard of the Bible, the more you grew up in church, saying like that, you're required to even give more. But the point that I that I want to make about this specific parable that's told here is that when the king comes back, and Jesus is the one telling the parable, the king's not satisfied when he receives the same amount that he gave him. When God gives us a commandment or when God tells us to do something or when God has something or a job for us to do, this king, which is in this case representing Jesus Christ, he's not satisfied with just them doing that. He wants them to take that money or he wants them to take that ability that they have or that talent and he wants them to double. He wants them to go above and beyond. I have you turn there to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. And we'll begin reading there in verse number 1. 2 Corinthians chapter number 8, verse number 1. The Bible says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. I want you to look for the word abundance, abounding, like we saw it twice already. And watch this concept. For to their power I bear them record. Yea, and beyond their power. Notice that. He said, for their power I bear them record. Or to their power, beyond their power, he says, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift, gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. He says, and this they did, not as we hoped. He's saying, not as we asked them. But first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. So he's saying they didn't even do just what we hoped, what we had thought they were going to do. They gave themselves unto the Lord, but then they also helped us out. He's saying they did more than what we had even asked them to do. Verse 6, in so much, so that they did so much of it, that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in the same grace also. Verse 7, therefore as ye abound in everything. In faith, and utterance, and knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. 
I want to be a type of Christian like the church at Corinth. I don't want to just be a Christian that when Paul wrote a letter to me that I'm just doing just the, just the mid medium, just what was asked of me when I leave. I don't want to only have that one talent that was given to me. I want Paul to write me a letter. I want God to look at me. And I want him to be proud of what I've done and, and say to me that I've done more than what he even asked me to do in the beginning. That he had confidence in my obedience, but he, he didn't only know that I was going to do what he asked me to do, but that I was going to do even more also. I want to have that reputation in my Christian life. Now, here I'm, we're going to turn to Matthew chapter number 5. We're going to turn to one other passage after this, and then we'll be finished. But Matthew chapter number 5. Now, I find this very interesting. Matthew chapter number 5 um, is a really popular passage. But I feel like it's, it's very often misunderstood. Matthew chapter number 5. Uh, oftentimes, you know, you'll hear people when they, when they when they read commentaries and they teach from Matthew chapter number 5. You'll hear people teach or preach the concept that, you know, this is Jesus kind of, you know, bringing in the New Testament and that the Old Testament is gone now. And that, you know, when he teaches these things, basically people believe sometimes that it's in contradiction to the Old Testament. But I'm going to show you that that's not so. And I want to show you actually what Matthew 5 is talking about. Uh, this is known as the Sermon on the Mount. So it's a very famous passage, very well-known passage. Now, uh, the Beatitudes ends in verse 12. And then right here we're going to begin reading Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 13. He says this. <clears throat> this gives us the context. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and be trodden under foot of men. So notice he says there in the beginning that they're the salt of the earth. They're supposed to be different is what he's saying. They're supposed to salt other things. And if the salt loses its savor, there's no other salt left, so they can't be salted because they're different than everything else. They're supposed to be the Caesar of the salt. Same thing in verse 14. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. So they're supposed to shine. And in a world of darkness, they're supposed to stand out. They're supposed to be different. And shine their light. Verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So notice the commandment he's giving them or what he's urging them to do is to stand out. You're, you need to be someone that stands out. You don't just do what everyone else does. But you need to stand out is what he's saying. Look at verse 17 too. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I, I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. So before he goes into this, and, and this is funny because right after this is where people start to teach that this stuff like contradicts the Old Testament. Look at, look at what he says there in verse 18. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, this is scary, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. A couple of side things that we can learn from that is that, that is just, that's more uh, teachings on eternal security. That when you do bad or when you teach people to do something that's not good, you're not going to go to hell. You're still going to go to heaven, but you'll be considered the least in heaven. See, there's, there, a lot of people think when we get to heaven that everyone's going to be on the same status or the same state. But the Bible real clearly right here says that some people are going to be the least in heaven, and other, people's are going to, other people will be the great, will be great, considered great in heaven. And then look what it says there in verse number 20. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now verse 21, this is where it gets very interesting. This is the part I want to focus on. There's different bullets here where he actually quotes things from the Old Testament or quote things that have been said. Ye have heard that was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Now watch it. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Rekah shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Now, is, is Jesus, when he says this, is he, is he contradicting or is he nullifying the commandment that thou shalt not kill? No, he's not doing that. What he's doing is he's adding to it. He's actually saying that you've heard that it's wrong, you know, to kill someone. But I'm saying unto you that if you want to kill someone in your heart, even, that that's just as bad. 
He's, he basically what he's doing is he's pushing it, not just as bad, but he's saying that that's also wrong. He's basically pushing the bar a little bit farther. Watch, he keeps doing it. Uh, we'll skip verse 23, 24. We'll go to the next point that he brings up. Verse 27. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So he's not saying it's all right to commit adultery. He's saying it's not only wrong to commit adultery, but you know what? You shouldn't even think about it in your heart. This isn't something, this is something. So what he's doing in all of these passages is he's raising the bar. He just got done telling them, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. They shouldn't be doing just the same as what everyone else is doing. You should be held at a higher standard. Look at what it says next there. The next passage we'll go to... Uh, uh, the next bullet, like I refer to him as, verse 33. He says, Again, ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oath. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is born is more than these cometh of evil. You have heard that it hath been said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now that was the law as far as the government goes. So he's saying, and, and I still believe that that's what would be just when Jesus is saying this. Because he's saying he's not, he didn't come to destroy the law. It would have been right if one person knocked on another person's tooth to take their tooth. If someone kills someone, they deserve that same punishment of what they had done to somebody else. But he's saying on a personal basis, watch what he says. You have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. The right thing to do would be to suffer reproach. That's what he's saying. He's holding the bar higher. Yeah, it might be right, as far as the law goes, and justice, for, for that person to lose their tooth. But you know what? Who the bigger man is, like we've heard people say that before, the person that's willing to suffer the reproach. That would be going above and beyond. Now, now this next uh, couple of phrases summarizes this. This whole, this, everything that he's speaking of here. Look at verse 39. Uh, or verse, yeah, you will read verse 39 again. But I say to you that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn, he says, turn to him the other also. Watch this verse 40. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. So notice how it's like going above and beyond. Now look at the next verse. It says, verse 41, And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Now we have a, a, a common expression that we'll use of when we're talking about someone going above and beyond. You know what it is? That company really goes the extra mile. And what are you saying when you say that? They really go above and beyond. Where if they said, hey, you know that guy on that basketball team, he's a, he works hard. Everybody on the team works hard, but that one guy, you know, he really goes the extra mile. This is where that phrase comes from. Jesus Christ is not nullifying all of the, all of the commandments of the past. He says first before he starts pe preaching, very clearly, I came not to destroy the law, and none of this will pass. And if anyone tries to teach men not to do these things, then they're going to be the least in the kingdom of heaven. Then he goes on, and what he does is he adds to the law. Not only does he, does he go ahead and he confirms the law, but he says, not only keep the law, but go above and beyond. If somebody wants you to run a mile with them, if somebody needs your help, don't only do what they need you to do, go above and beyond. Don't just do what's requested of you. Don't just, you know, when, when the opportunity comes up to volunteer to do something at church, Come volunteer, but maybe even do something else. Maybe even find something else to do. Not only, just like the people, he said they did too much in the Old Testament. He said they brought more than what they needed. So when somebody, when we go soul winning at church, it's good to come soul winning. That's just the reasonable service. But also go out on your own. Find people to witness to or to give the gospel to there. Read, read your Bible every day. But not only read your Bible, look for other things to do. You know, that's just the commandment. The Bible says, you know, we're kings and priests in the New Testament. And the Bible says that the king was commanded to read his Bible every day. So that's you in the New Testament. You're commanded to read your Bible every day. But that's just the reasonable service. Fine. Go, go above and beyond. Run the extra mile. You know, uh, run twain. You know, when you're looking for an op when you have nothing to do, memorize the Bible. Memorize scripture. Do more than what was asked of you. 
Be a Philemon. Be like the church at Corinth. Do more than what was asked of you. Going into 2018, let's not have small goals. I don't want to die and look back at the end of my life and say, I was an average Christian. I did only what was asked of me. I, did, I don't want to stand before God and God looks at me and says, yeah, thanks for that one talent that I gave you. And you didn't multiply anything. You didn't do any more. You know, people oftentimes have a different view of how God's going to react to us. He, when he tells the parable, he says, thou wicked and slothful servant. I want, I want to stand before God, and I want God to be pleased with the things that I've done. I don't want to just do the minimum or just do what God has, has commanded me to do. I want to do much more than that. I want to go above and beyond, and I want God to be pleased with me. Amen. The, the passage I want to end on here is Luke chapter number 17. Luke chapter number 17. I'm going to read to you a couple other passages where Paul's writing. If you don't mind, turn to Luke chapter number 17. The Bible says in Philippians chapter number 1, verse number 9, This I pray that your love may abound yet more, and more in knowledge, and in all judgment. Colossians chapter 2, verse 7, Rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as ye have been taught. And then he says, abounding therein with thanksgiving. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12, the Bible says, And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another. And toward all men, even as we do toward you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, watch this, so ye would abound more and more. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. Last one I'll read, then we'll go to Luke 17. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is me, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other, he says, aboundeth. Now look there in Luke chapter number 17, verse number 5. Luke chapter number 17, verse number 5. <clears throat> the Bible says, I mentioned this earlier, and the apostle said unto the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if ye had faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye might say unto this sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. Verse 7. But which of you, now watch this, but which of you having a servant, plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him, by and by, it means like immediately or right away, when he has come from the field, go and sit down to me. So he's saying, once the servant's done with his work, who's going to say to his servant when he comes back in, go ahead and eat? Watch what he says. And will not rather say unto him, so this is what you would really say, make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself. He's saying, then gird yourself, then you eat, and serve me. Till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. So some of us might look at that and say, this is a really good servant. He's doing really great work. Watch what Jesus says. Verse 9, doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not, meaning I think not. I trow not. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which were commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. So notice what Jesus said. Jesus said, when you do the things that I command you, you're not going above and beyond. You're just doing your duty. The Bible talks about in Romans how you know, it's our reasonable service to serve God. For what God has done for us, we could never repay him for the works that we do. But we could at least keep his commandments. And not only keep his commandments, find opportunities in 2018 not only just to be a better Christian, but to go above and beyond. When you're at your work, you know, you're representing you know, your church here and you're representing Jesus Christ. When you're at your work, don't just do a mediocre job. Go above and beyond. What a great reputation it'd be if all the employers knew, like, hey, the people in New Macedonia, old regular Baptist church, all those guys work real hard. They're, they're known for not only, just like Philemon, they have a reputation of not only doing what I command them to do, but they go above and beyond. They do more than what I ask them to do. What a great reputation that would be for the church here and for Jesus Christ. That we would do more than what he asks us. So don't set your sight, your sights low on things. Don't have small goals. Desire to do more than what you've had. Desire when you get to heaven that Jesus Christ would look at you when he judges us and sees us and say, you know, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been you know, faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Amen. And remember, it wasn't the guy that just had the one talent. The guy that just did what he had asked him to do or just what he gave him. It was the guys that did 
more than what he had asked. Because the guy that just did what he had asked, that's just his duty. He's not going above and beyond. He's not doing anything extra. He's just keeping the commandments that were given to him. It's just our reasonable service. So let's not go into 2018 with you know, just being satisfied or being happy with the same Christian life that we have now. Let's go above and beyond. Let's do more for Jesus than we did in 2017 or even in our entire lives. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for this night. And Lord, we thank you for, as I said, preserving our life. We thank you for being the perfect example for us, Lord. That, uh, that we may, dear God, look at somebody and uh, that live lives. Also having great examples in the Old Testament for us. Of people that went above and beyond. Amen. Dear God, we thank you for the Bible. Uh, we thank you. I thank you for this church, dear Lord. That I have a Baptist church I could grow up in, dear God, and learn the Bible. And uh, I ask you that you would uh, help us, uh, dear Lord, in this next year. To go into this year uh, with uh, spiritual things in our mind. Yes. And wanting to, to grow spiritually and abound spiritually. Not just be satisfied with living a mediocre Christian life. We love you so much, dear Lord. Just be with us. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen, brother. God bless you. Amen. You want to keep that microphone? I do indeed. Hey, Dale. Uh, Tyler, are you keeping the mic? Yeah, that's why I said I do. I'll take it. Okay. okay. I'm going to close here in just a minute.
But you know, let's let's just uh, as, as this new year comes up, as Tyler said, let's try to be better and more profitable service to God. Let's try to be all that we can be, because they are just you know just serving God should just be a reasonable service. We ought to be able to go up uh, more beyond that and, and farther and farther into what God would have us to be and what God would have us to do. Thank you all for coming here tonight. Like I said, I don't want to keep you out very late. I don't want you to be out too late when all the crazy and drunks are driving around. We should all get back home safe. But thank you for coming. I hope you all enjoyed the evening here. Uh, it was a good time, a good Christian fellowship. I'd much rather do this. I, I, I spent my New Year Eve in bars before playing music, spending at a friend's house. You know, it's a lot more enjoyable spending in church with Christian Amen. fellowship, Amen. with Christian people, praying for, to God, singing songs of glory and praise to God, hearing God's word. What, what, what better way can you spend a New Year's Eve? What better way can you take out the old year, bring in the new year? What better way can you do that? You know, let, let's ask God's blessing. Let's just close here, close the service, and ask God's blessing. You know, Uncle Jesse, you close us in prayer, if you don't mind. Brother Hunter, God bless you. We had such a good time, Brother Hunter. Amen. Amen. You know, when the Lord is in the arrangements, it's not, it's not hard to have a good time. I want to thank the Lord for saying, Brother, Brother Hunter, uh, Tyler's down here, Lord, with a good, great message, Lord. It's very refreshing to see these young men with more on their mind than the earth they think. We thank you, Lord, for the way you used him. It was such an inspiration. Amen. I can feast on that for a long time. You are so blessed, folks, to have a place like this to come to. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. We know that you are the grand architect of the universe. Yeah. That you are the maker and the preserver of all things, Lord. Without you, nothing was made that was made, Lord. We thank you for it. Thank you for this little church, Lord. Continue to be with it. We pray and give us understanding. And let us read more this year and study more. And you know, one of these days, dear God, you'll call us home. Amen. And what a great reunion that will be. You know, and uh, sometimes I think my old boss kind of gets in a hurry to get there. But you know, the Lord's in charge. When the time comes to take us home, he will. Amen. And we'll be happy forever. Those of us who have, who have accepted him, We'll be happy forever and ever. Lord, continue to be with us. That's what church and all of us are doing to pray for you, Heavenly Father. Those who are sick, lay your healing hand on them and give them health and strength. We pray and give us time for this home, Lord. Thank you again, dear Father, for allowing us to come down to your house tonight to serve you in spirit and in truth. What a great, what a great time we had. God bless us all. We thank we ask in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Happy New Year, everybody. Have a safe one.
Oh, I'm getting it. Yeah. 